we're going to talk about isotropic radiation. Now I'll just start with the word isotropic just means uniform uh, in every direction. So if you imagine I had a transmitter, if it transmitted a sphere of energy, and that sphere just got larger and larger in space, that would be isotropic, meaning it's the same in all directions. So if energy is emitted from a single point, it will be distributed equally in all direction over a hypothetical sphere. And down here in the bottom, if you can imagine, here's the center point. If the energy is being radiated in the sphere, the area at a certain distance increases and the power density decreases by that unit area. The way to think about it is if I integrate over this sphere in this circle I have the same amount of power as I do here as I do here. And So you can imagine as my area gets larger the power density in the given area is less because my transmitted power is fixed and my power is going to reduce by the rate of the area, which reduces by over r squared. And so the density of power is defined as the power that a point source emits divided by the area of the sphere. And so just envision in your mind, this is how the basic antenna works, is it just emits power, assuming it's like a sphere in all directions. And the reason why the signal is faint or weak at a far distance is just simply because as we move farther away, the radius of that circle is bigger, and each unit square that we might receive energy from has less and less energy per unit area or a lower power density. So now let's talk about the idea of antenna gain. The power to a transmitter connects to the antenna at its terminals. So we can think about, if we have a little cartoon of an antenna here, I'm going to connect it right there, and here's my PT. So really, it is sort of a point source. I have power coming in, and it's a fixed unit of measure that I know. But what I don't know is how that power is going to propagate out in space. In the previous slide, we had just assumed that it was a perfect sphere that was getting larger as the distance increased. And that's what the isotropic model does, is it assumes it radiates in all directions evenly. In reality, however, the power is often directed by the antenna. And we characterize this direction with a quantity d and a quantity u that is the intensity per unit angle. And so I got my little cartoon here, but you can imagine if this is the terminal to your antenna right here, this little bullhorn is focusing all of the sound in this area so that if you were over here or over here, you'd hear very little sound. And we can write the directivity as the ratio of the peak power at any angle by the total radiated power. Now, what do I mean by the peak power? Well, if you can imagine I have my little antenna, and I do a plot out from it, and I walk around and I say, OK, let me look at this antenna. What's the peak power here? And then I go here and I look at the peak power there. If I go all the way around the angles and I find the maximum power, that's what I'm going to put in here. So the way to think about it is, if we go back to our sound example, if you were listening right here, you'd hear a very loud sound. If you were listening over here, you'd hear a much softer sound. And so the directivity is going to be the ratio of the peak sound here to the total sound coming out. And if we plotted that in our little cartoon here, we'd see that we have a little bit of power then we have a lot of acoustic power coming out of there. And you can already tell that we have some directivity going on. We're going to do a specific example to make this more concrete. So let's do an example where the radiation intensity of an antenna is given as the following. And what this means is, if you remember, U happens to be, if I have my little antenna at the center of a circle, right, and I move around, I can either go by phi, or I can go by theta. I believe I have a diagram here that will give that to us. There we go. As I move around theta or I move around phi, I'm basically plotting what the intensity is at any point 
out here as I move around those. And you can see that the maximum that U is ever going to be is A in this example. Now I just want to be real specific. This is an example I'm giving you. So I'm using a concrete form of an antenna directivity function so that you can see how we calculate directivity. Now what I'm going to do is go and plot this radiation pattern. And I'm going to use that the peak is 2, or basically A is equal to 2. And I just plop that in MATLAB, and here we are. And so the way to think about this is this antenna, as theta is moving around, I'm going to have the power curve looks like this. So that means if I'm at this end to the antenna, I receive the peak power. But if I'm over here, I would receive almost no power. And you can see this is a very directive antenna that's pointing upwards. And so now I'm going to calculate D, but to do that I need to figure out what the total power is. And that's going to be basically an integral over all of theta. And then I also have to integrate all of phi. So basically I integrate over the entire sphere surface to figure out what the total power radiated is. Because remember, this function is just telling me what the power intensity is. If somebody told me what was being driven into the antenna by the transmitter, I could just use that number. But what I'm going to do is calculate it directly from the intensity function. And it's given down here in the bottom, and I'm not going to go through the derivation because I just want to show you that we're calculating the total radiated power in spherical coordinates. This is u, which is a function of theta and phi, and you notice there's no phi component here, so the phi component is just 1, and all of this is just spherical coordinates. And as we integrate around, we end up with a total radiated power of this. And this is just geometry of what the antenna would look like. And now that I have the total radiated power and I have the peak, I can calculate the directivity by 4 pi peak over the radiated. And if I go through the math, I end up with a directivity of 1.7. So what exactly does that 1.7 mean? Well, that means that if I were to build an isotropic um, antenna that had exactly the same power as the total power as this antenna, so here's maybe the plot of my isotropic, meaning it's uniform, the ratio between this peak point and here is going to be 1.7. So it's basically saying, how focused is this antenna compared to an isotropic antenna? And so we can define our gain as simply E times D, where D is the directivity we just calculated. And E is simply the efficiency of the antenna. So this may be that your antenna might have, for instance, a 20% loss, so the efficiency might be uh, 80%. So you just multiply 80 by D. If we assume a lossless antenna in the previous example, uh, this would just give us a gain of the transmitting antenna as 1.7. And like I said before, this means if you pointed the antenna at your receiver, you would have a 1.7 times more power at the receiver compared to an isotropic transmitter. Now you need to remember that the power from an isotropic reduces as 1 over r squared. G isn't giving you the actual power received, it's telling you the ratio. So that means that as you move away from the antenna, it's still dropping as 1 over R squared. It's just that the ratio of the antenna with a gain of 1.7 has 1.7 times more power in the directivity that is highest, or we could see that was the upward uh, pointing lobe. Now, when we talk about receivers, um, a transmitting an antenna and a receiving an antenna uh, are both linear systems and they're both uh, can be a dual of one another. So that means everything we said about a transmitting antenna we could say about a receiving antenna. But when we start to think about physically what's going on, um, it takes a little bit of thinking to see how we could take the gain of a transmitting antenna and reverse it to a receiver. So what we do is we use a slightly different concept and that is called the receiver effective area. The receiver uses an antenna to collect the parts of a transmitted power which reaches it after transmission. The amount of received power depends on the receiver's effective area, and this is oftentimes called the aperture. Okay, And so the received power is simply the transmitted power at some distance r times a, this area or the aperture. And we can calculate that. Here's the transmitted power. 
here is the free space isotropic model. Remember, we're losing power as r squared. And here is the effective area or aperture. And that gives us our um, power received. And the way to think about it is if I've got my little receiving antenna here, and uh, I have an electromagnetic wave coming from some transmitter, let's say, way over here. Now, by the time I get out to here, this is going to look like a plane wave. So it's pretty flat. And the idea is, if I imagined a surface that this wave was impinging upon, how much energy would I receive? And so I've got my transmitted power. It's reduced by the 1 over r squared, so that's the density coming in. And then I multiply it by my effective antenna area. Now, that effective antenna area could be an actual antenna area, or it could be something larger or smaller than the actual antenna area, depending upon its gain. And that makes sense because before we saw that if our transmitting antenna had gain, that meant in one direction it could actually have more power than it would if it was an isotropic antenna. And so this is our area with our incident power, and we can calculate then the received power just from this flux times this area. Now, if the antenna has a larger effective area or aperture, it collects more power. I think that's pretty intuitive. And so we can interpret this as gain. And so we define the gain of our receiving antenna as the effective area or aperture times 4 pi over lambda squared. And if you hold on a second, I'll explain where this lambda squared comes from. So as we said, it's pretty clear the antenna gain for the receiver is dependent upon its size. And the size of the antenna should always be stated in comparison to the wavelength. And this is because G for receiving antenna is defined in terms of an isotropic receiving antenna. Well, what does that mean? That means G always tells us how good does this antenna work compared to an isotropic one. And if you go through the mathematics, this lambda over 2 is how we go as a conversion from an area to a gain when we compare this to an isotropic antenna. So that's just where this lambda over 2 comes. But I think physically you can see pretty clearly that the area is pretty intu intuitive. And so now I've got this final question here. What's the largest antenna that you've ever seen? So here's the uh, observatory down in Puerto Rico. It's one of the world's largest singer, single aperture telescopes. And it's 305 uh, meters. And as it's referenced here, GoldenEye uh, was shot partly in here. And you can see, if I can draw on the screen here, this is the area. And because it has a little bit of a curve, it actually has some focusing capability. And so its effective aperture is actually going to be um, different from just its physical dimension. And in case you wondered, um, the way they uh, steer this antenna, because obviously this big circle is all fixed, what they do is they take the receiver, which is right here, and they move it on these wires around so that the focal point will hit different points in the antenna and look at different points in the sky. All right, enough about big antennas.